without um, further ado, this what we'll do for this session is we'll we'll have um, you know a brief presentation by Dr. Mariano and Dr. Patton um, going over um, not only um, an introduction to to um, social media, but also how we can um, begin to to slowly get get into it for like I mentioned those of us who aren't as active, and then at the end we'll have time um, available for question and answers. Well, great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, I think this is a, it's definitely an important topic, and it's one that has come up um, much more frequently in just in the last few years. And so when I look at some of the things that I get invited to speak about, um, it started initially as, as just regional anesthesia. And then I'd say in the last several years, it's kind of been an even split between um, maximizing your digital presence, uh, using social media, and a little bit of regional anesthesia. And um, so I think that this is a, a timely topic. I appreciate the invitation to present on this. Um, we'll go ahead and we'll record this um, presentation part that will be split between myself and Dr. Patton. And then, and then we'll stop the recording before the discussion. Um, that way we can make the talks available um, you know, to everyone who um, you know, wasn't able to join. Uh, but then we, we'll leave the, the question part um, private, so that way we can have some some real Q and A you know, on some of the things that I think that um, you know, hopefully will help impact your use of social media. So, uh, doctors, uh, Dr. Patton and I, uh, neither one of us have any financial disclosures, um, and as mentioned, you know, we are um, heavily involved in the CSA, um, and so I am myself as president elect, um, and uh, these are our opinions, of course. Uh, they don't reflect our employers uh, or the society, but hopefully will be helpful. Uh, to any of you who are thinking about um, how social media really fits into your career um, and advancing our profession of anesthesiology. And so I think when I, for myself, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a late user, I think, in social media. Um, and so the way that I've tried to wrap my head around it um, you know, as someone who only started using um, any platforms for social media in the last, um, really the last nine years, um, I like this definition from the Oxford Dictionary um, and it really is a very general. It's the use of uh, websites and applications that enable users to create and share content or participate in social networking. And I think that that leaves it fairly open and gives you, um, uh, I think, a, a good idea of how many different things that we use on an everyday basis that actually fall into this category of social media platforms. Um, because there are just so many things that actually fall into this giant a uh, grab bag of, of the social media definitions. And we of course can't talk about all of them, but hopefully we'll focus on things that I think are a little bit more relevant um, and timely. Um, you know, popular platforms, uh, preferred platforms, just between the two of us. And of course that, that will be the bias is that you know, there are certain platforms that, um, that we as users tend to prefer. Um, and so much of our perspectives will come from that experience. Now, when I look at um, the world of social media, and these are the statistics that come out of the Pew Institute, and every year they update this, it's a great source for information. Um, but you see, by the end of 2021, um, you know, most Americans use some form of social media. And the most popular platform, of course, today is, is YouTube. Um, but it's still followed by Facebook, which has uh, plateaued, but still remains heavily popular. Um, you see growing use of Instagram, which is also um, owned by Facebook. Um, and then you see um, you know, the, in more recent years, um, you see uh, TikTok, uh, WhatsApp. WhatsApp is also owned by Facebook. Um, and then you see a kind of a long clump of other platforms, LinkedIn, Snapchat, Twitter, um, that are kind of in there. And then, and then you see the interesting one for me was Nextdoor. Um, Nextdoor, of course, uh, for those of you uh, who have, um, have a uh, yeah, very chatty uh, neighborhood uh, <laughs> discussions on Nextdoor will appreciate the fact that yes, that does fit the definition of, of sharing a content and creating content. So, um, but, uh, but an interesting perspective, I think, on what you use. Um, I think that one lesson that I've learned for myself is that you don't have to use them all. You probably shouldn't use them all. Um, I would argue that you should just use what you're most comfortable using because I think that that, you know, at least in my perspective, it will allow you to leverage um, the, all the positives of a particular platform or platforms um, yeah, and hopefully um, yeah, advantage you in terms of your career development. Now, for myself, um, I am a very heavy Twitter user, and so yeah, that will be the platform that I have focused most of my attention on. Um, and then, of course, yeah, Dr. Patton will talk about um, yeah, his favorite platform and yeah, platforms, 
Um, but I'll point out that um, yeah, I think you can kind of see you know, just how important it is, I think, you know, to really focus on a platform where you can understand um, you know, the native culture of the platform and then try to leverage the advantages and disadvantages. Um, so we'll talk about each of our perspectives you know, from, uh, from really the, um, you know, the ex uh, from the experience, uh, first person experience you know, point of view. And so I, as I mentioned, yeah, I am you know, I, I would say uh, almost predominantly uh, using Twitter. And this is really a source of information for me. Um, in, in addition to some of the networking aspects, um, I use it to learn because um, at least in my specialty area of regional anesthesia, um, we were just speaking before we started the, you know, the discussion today and just how many regional anesthesia people around the world are on Twitter. So it allows for these um, almost real time global interactions um, I can also um, pay attention to conversations to learn which topics are timely. Um, it helps influence uh, my own uh, scholarly activities because I can sometimes see which topics you know, may need um, you know, research articles or review articles you know, that will hopefully address a knowledge gap, um, as well as help share some of the work that we do uh, within our local institution with others. Um, and so because of that, I think um, I've mostly been trying to understand yeah, how uh, this platform, Twitter, as a form of social media, how it really relates um, you know, to what I consider much more traditional um, academic metrics like citations and impact factor. And, um, and I found this paper really interesting, especially for someone like myself you know, in academic medicine, um, you know, who I did my master's in clinical research, and I was very interested in doing clinical trial research and publishing research, um, that uh, that what we think of as a traditional metric, so uh, citations, for example, um, really lag almost months to years behind what we consider social media buzz, or, or in this article, they call them tweetations. So if an article comes out and it's super interesting, then people talk about it right away because it gets published. And then, you know, you're, and then that type of interest um, generates down the road you know, to uh, 11 times a higher likelihood of being cited. And that makes sense because I think more people are getting exposure to the work um, and then they're more likely to know about it when they write their own paper. But I think it actually goes both ways because um, if you actually publish something that is highly discussed, um, it also tells you what's interesting to people. And maybe that shifts your direction in terms of scholarship because you'll realize, oh, you know, when I shared this one paper, it got a lot of activity. But then when I shared this other paper that was you know, on a different topic, you know, maybe that didn't generate as much interest. Now, in terms of meetings, and now that we've started live meetings again, I found that this is also very useful. Um, the pandemic, I think, in my opinion, um, has really changed how people really view um, you know, the, the importance of live meetings. And I think that one advantage for um, you know, using Twitter, at least at a live conference, is that you can not only interact with people at the meeting who are sitting in different sessions than you, but you can also interact with people who didn't make it to the meeting at all. And I think as, um, as we start to see maybe a shift in priorities for how many people go to live meetings, um, I think being able to follow a meeting hashtag to see what people are learning um, when they go to that, that conference, it allows you to still be part of those learning activities and also yeah, not necessarily miss out on what's happening um, because I think that the high quality tweets that I see um, oftentimes capture in many ways, you know, the high points um, uh, of the talk itself. And, and I would say more often than not, um, as certain specialty societies like ASRA um, host meetings, many of the speakers themselves are on Twitter. And so, um, so oftentimes if you mention them um, and questions come up from people around the world who weren't at the live meeting, they'll often respond and actually answer some of those questions, even though those people you know, were nowhere near um, inside the room. And so I'll just give you a couple of examples, like a real networking examples um, that I find just fascinating, especially as someone um, who is not a digital native. Uh, I, I mean, I didn't have a cell phone until I'd finished medical school and I only had to use it for emergencies because you know, in case I got stranded on some like rural road in Virginia where I was doing my internship, um, and, and I only started using social media with the use of Twitter in 2013, 20, 20, uh, so, um, so only nine years ago, and it was only because I was chairing a meeting and uh, one of my colleagues had encouraged me to start my Twitter account, um, Raj Gupta in Vanderbilt, uh, who also came up with the Azure Coags app. And, and since then, I've learned a lot of things. So I, had, I got contacted um, through, a, through direct messages 
um, from uh, Dr. Mary Brindle, who's a pediatric surgeon in Calgary. And she asked if I was interested in participating in look, uh, looking at the WHO safe surgery checklist, um, which is like the, like the surgical safety checklist um, that the World Health Organization puts out. And yeah, I almost could not believe that this was a real thing. Um, and so, um, yeah, I followed it up. Yeah, she sent me an email and I said, yes, like I'd love to go and do this. It was right before the pandemic. So we went out to Boston in 2019, December, and that's where I met Atul Gawande. And, uh, and we worked on this. And then during the pandemic, of course, you know, we you know, this group, we worked virtually to come up with um, adaptations of the WHO safe, safe surgery checklist uh, for the, uh, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and then some of you will remember that um, back in 2020, there were no graduations. And so um, you know, one of the things that I had seen that spring was the AMA had put out a, a great um, a recorded video for the graduates of 2020 for the medical schools. And so, so I messaged um, someone who I had already met in real life, but was, yeah, had followed on Twitter for a long time. Um, Dr. Jerome Adams, our, uh, the, the only anesthesiologist surgeon general in history. And I messaged him, I did the same thing. I messaged him and said, and said, well, you know, to borrow an idea from the AMA, would you be willing to record a short graduation message for the anesthesiology residents and fellows who are finishing their training um, in 2020? And so, um, so he wrote me back and put me in touch with, um, it, it, he was still Surgeon General at the time. So I had to go through um, you know, the media relations people at Health and Human Services. And then I involved ASA. And so, and you can still, if you scan the QR code, you can actually see the video. So ASA actually took that um, and made it a more general um, ASA leadership um, graduation video with the keynote address given by Dr. Jerome Adams, which was pretty awesome that it started out as um, you know, just DMing Dr. Adams on Twitter. And so, um, a couple of things I would say is that, um, and, and Dr. Patton will get into this a little bit more, is that there, there are always some things you have to think about when using social media. But I would say if you, in general, use similar rules as, uh, to say speaking in public, um, then uh, you're, those are generally good rules to follow. So I think remember patient privacy above all things. Um, nothing that you post is ever an emergency. Uh, so you know, take some time, think about it, um, I'm, I'm per, I personally like to proofread a lot because um, if I'm probably more than I proofread my own manuscripts before I send them into a journal because at least, you know, I'm, there, people are more likely to see my tweets than, my, than read my papers, you know, which is sadly true, but I accept it and I'm okay with that. Um, the, the other thing, if you want to try this out, so I think that um, I'm biased, of course, but I like, I think Twitter is a great platform in this respect because um, you can get a lot of interesting information, especially depending on your area of subspecialty. And since I'm in regional anesthesia, I know there are lots of regional anesthesia people um, who are on Twitter. Um, and so the easiest thing that I've found is just start an account, um, put something very brief about yourself. You know, say, use your, put in your degrees so that way people know um, who it is, who you are and what you do. Um, something short and you know, make sure there's a photo so that way there's no like mystery uh, egg or silhouette um, that they actually know it's you. And then just follow a couple of accounts just to see what people do. And I think like everything uh, you have to observe first. Um, a couple things if you get to the point where you know, after observing for a while that you want to tweet. Um, and I find this very true, especially when, when I'm at a meeting. Um, yeah, because I, I try not to uh, tweet too much, um, but just because I think that it overwhelms people a little bit. Um, but I try to make the tweets very useful. And so the things that are considered best practices you know, for tweeting, um, because you don't have that many characters, right? You have 280 characters. Um, you want to make sure that there's at least some high yield content there. So I try to use uh, something like hashtags and you know, Twitter will often suggest them as you start to type them out um, that tell people that this conversation can be grouped under a keyword or phrase. Um, using images is also very helpful. Um, if you know that the person speaking is on Twitter, then I always mention them. So that way they know that you're sharing their work and also can be part of the conversation. Um, and then you can, of course, tag people similar to how you tag people in other social media platforms. And so if you know people who may be interested in that content, then why not let them know, um, especially if you think that um, yeah, they may not be at your meeting. Uh, sometimes I'll do this, um, especially for some of the things that we discuss at our meetings related to the opioid epidemic or pain management. Um, I may uh, tag uh, pain physicians or surgeons, uh, people whom I've collaborated with um, either in person or virtually, uh, who may be interested in whatever topic it is that I'm listening to. 
Um, and then this is just another example. This is from Jeff Gadsden. He's the um, yeah, he's a Duke. He's a good friend of mine for many, many years. Um, and uh, and when you're at a meeting, I think it's always good to remember that most um, conferences today um, have a designated meeting hashtag. So um, so include that, um, and that and you can use that on any of the social media platforms as well. Um, that just helps to group those conversations, um, so that way, if you ever search for them, it's easy to see what people are are learning. And and this is still very useful, even if you're at the meeting, because. Um, as many of you know, from being at conferences where there are multiple sessions happening, you can't be in two places at once. Um, so you know, while you're sitting in one hall, someone else is learning something different in another hall. Um, and so this is one way that um, you can at least pick up some of the things that people are learning. Um, I will say that uh, Twitter is, uh, can be an ugly place. Um, and you know, some of you have probably seen some of it, um, if you've ever been on Twitter before or, or you've heard negative things about it. Um, you know, one of the things that I always recommend doing is just to protect yourself. So, um, so if you go to your settings, and this is actually, these are screenshots from my phone. So this is what the mobile interface will look like. But if you go to your settings, um, find privacy and safety, um, go to, go scroll down, find direct messages, um, and then, and then make sure that these two boxes, the first one you know, that allow message requests from everyone, make sure that's not checked. So it will default to checked, so uncheck it, and then also make sure that the low quality message filter is checked. Um, so this will definitely help because you don't want random people sending you direct messages. So yeah, that I think is probably a good rule of thumb in life. Um, so you make sure you do that. Um, I, I put some uh, resources on my own website, um, and I know we won't talk about you know like having your own blog and stuff today, but. Um, but I do think that um, it's helpful, I think, to know how to do um, you know, some of this work, um, you know, especially if uh, you plan on using social media and trying to use it as um, you know, hopefully for career enrichment. Um, so I think learning sort of the, some of the basics on you know, how to choose platforms, how to develop content, um, I think is helpful. So I try to keep this relatively up to date. And I'll just finish with a couple of thoughts um, that are related to advancing our profession. Um, I do think that, I mean, this, you can see the, the interview was actually before COVID, um, but I think that I, as I've gotten more involved, I think in the use of um, social media uh, as part of my career, um, yeah, I find that it's just another form of communication. And so um, you know, just like we would try to educate our patients on what the best evidence is and, and our recommendations <laughs> for practice, that I do think that it's very important that we try to be involved in these conversations um, yeah, even when um, yeah, even when they occur online. So, which is why I think that um, physicians really should be on social media as well, because that's where the people are. Um, and I think if you're if you're not sure whether this should be you, um, I would say it should be you, because um, you know, right now, I mean, doctors are still at the top of the list of most respected professions. So, um, if if you're out there with the people and providing information that is scientifically accurate, then um, then you are also serving as someone um, who, yeah, who is combating much of that, uh, that misinformation. Because remember, you can't tell patients not to look things up. They will, of course, look things up because that's what they're going to do. Um, and everyone uses the internet. So, um, so I think that that's um, just my, my own, at least for my, my own justification for you know, why I think that um, we as um, physicians and as you know, healthcare professionals and as leaders in our community you know, need to be where the people are. And we know that there's a lot of, um, unfortunately, there's a lot of you know, misinformation out there. Um, and I think we've seen a lot of it. And I know, um, you know early in the pandemic, this is like, this happened around the beginning of the summer. Uh, this is a congressional candidate you know, for a Florida seat um, who was spreading uh, misinformation about masks causing fungal and bacterial pneumonia. And this is probably the one tweet that um, I've ever sent out that actually got, got some traction. Um, but, yeah, but it actually led to something fairly positive, I think, um, after I'd sent this tweet, and uh, this one actually um, you know, got shared a lot, um, I contacted the ASA and so um, you know, to help draft this statement. So I helped work on this one, which is, uh, seems sort of obvious, but, um, but wasn't clearly obvious um, that the ASA and APSF put out a joint statement on the necessity of wearing face masks and talked about the safety and the fact that we are a physician profession um, as anesthesiologist that you know, re wears masks regularly. So, um, so don't, don't take it for granted that what you think is obvious is obvious to everyone. And then of course, you know, the last thing I'll say is that this just happened recently. 
Um, this is actually one of our anesthesiology faculty members at Stanford, yeah, who was um, a, a guest contestant on Jeopardy. Um, and if you remember that um, yeah, he, the, our, our host, um, who is very well educated, um, he had commented that um, that he was just an anesthesiologist, and so um, so I thought that um, yeah, that comment. I mean, I, I made my own comment about it um, after thinking about it for a few days. Um, but I think this is a great opportunity for us then to say, you know what? Um, yeah, like I think that this um, yeah this is really uh, it demonstrates a lack of um, of, of information. Um, this is our chance to provide more information. And so I think the ASA also had a great response to this as well. And so I think with that, I'm going to hand it off uh, to Dr. Patton. Let's see. Thank you. And I think, um, I guess I'll just uh, let you know when to uh, change slides, Ed. Perfect. Okay. So um, I am uh, John Patton. I was a resident at Stanford. I did my fellowship at Cedar sinai in regional, and I'm now at UCLA. And I just wanted to start off by basically just giving a little sort of introduction of me into social media. So I remember the day, I'm kind of dating myself right now, when Facebook came to UC Irvine and set up a booth to get people to sign up for Facebook. This was back when I was a sophomore. So this would have been 20 or 2004. And so Obviously, we've come a very long way from the poking <laughs> of Facebook, the Facebook actually, forgot it was the Facebook, they, the Facebook back then, to where we are now um, with multiple uh, social media platforms. And as Dr. Mariano mentioned, um, my strategy is, is simply to try and do the best that I can to meet my patients and my community where they are. Obviously, a barrier to entry to um, accessing social media is having a, a cellular phone, which nowadays, and I don't say this to, to you know, obviously uh, to, to mention this lightly, there is definitely still a lot of socioeconomic, um, uh, uh, you know, stressors and disadvantages that, that, that exist that make it difficult for people to have access to information. But many people have cell phones, <laughs> actually lots of people have cell phones. And so many people have access to social media. And so for me, as an African-American physician, regional anesthesiologist, um, I have multiple interests in terms of people that I'd like to interact with. So you see, this is my TikTok account on the left side. This is my Instagram on the right side. Um, I was early to uh, Instagram, late to TikTok, although many will argue I was still early to, to TikTok even as well. Um, I got on the TikTok after they had already sold, uh, by, by Dan sold it to, to TikTok. Um, but um, I'll say that, you know, for me, um, my accounts, these two accounts really saw significant growth in, in 2020. Um, a lot of us decided uh, in 2019 to join TikTok because we realized, oh, this new platform is super cool and you have a chance to go viral really fast and people are, you know, growing these huge accounts that really other platforms made it very challenging for you to grow that fast. Um, clearly, TikTok wanted to have an advantage over other platforms and they wanted to keep people engaged. And so obviously that was one reason to try and, you know, develop algorithms that allow for, for content to, to spread really fast. And so as healthcare professionals in 2020, that was actually a really advantageous thing for us, right? Um, and so for me, my accounts are all public. I don't have a private account and a public account. I don't think of myself as Bruce Wayne or Batman. I, I think it's actually really challenging to have two separate accounts. Some people like to do that. But as Dr. Mariano mentioned, anything you post online is going to be public, no matter what you think. If you have a private account and it makes it difficult for people to access it, unless they click on your you know, uh, account and they, they actually are friends with you, someone can still access that information. So it just never really made sense for me to have one because if I post something that I probably shouldn't have posted anyway on a private account, someone finds it, I'm still gonna get in trouble, <laughs> right? So I decided to keep it open because I want my accounts to be easily accessible to people who have questions or concerns, although I'm not answering health, you know, questions, or I'm not giving medical information. Um, but, um, you know, people who had questions about, you know, maybe someone who looks like me who's in middle school or high school wants to know how I became a physician. I didn't want that person to have a challenge uh, being able to access me because when I was coming through, um, you know, these platforms didn't exist. So this is a great way for us to communicate. Obviously, recognize the importance of professionalism. So for me, though, I have nothing to hide. I try to be very uh, much so mindful of what I post, as Dr. Mariano mentioned, and anything that I post, for the most part, um, when I click send or submit, um, I, I, I stand behind it. So I share everything uh, publicly. Uh, next. And so as Dr. Mariano mentioned with uh, Twitter, I just wanted to give some uh, more statistics. And so this, this just shows how rapidly TikTok has been growing. 
right? So TikTok is not quite on the level of YouTube or, or Facebook or Meta, which, you know, obviously Meta has many different platforms as we've already discussed, and, and so does Google. Um, but TikTok is really growing very fast, as you can see. So as I mentioned, 2019, before Charlie D'Amelio and, and, and Addison and all, all those influencers started really making TikTok uh, uh, go, um, you saw a little bit of growth in, in, in 2019. Actually, there's a dip there in Q2. And then all of a sudden, it just absolutely takes off. And it's now uh, being downloaded um, uh, you know, as much as, or, or more than, sorry, uh, all of the other um, uh, competitors here. You see Instagram, Facebook, and Snapchat as of Q, Q2 of 2020. Next slide. Or next click, I should say. And this is just shows you the worldwide download. So from Q2 of 2019 and Q2 of 2020, there was a 92% um, growth, uh, which is significant uh, for, for any platform. Um, and there was obviously a lot of concerns people had with TikTok in terms of cybersecurity and, and you know, the fact that um, it was owned, it, it is owned, sorry, by, by China. And so people had concerns about safety and data and whatnot. But you can see clearly, irrespective of all these concerns, a lot of people have flocked um, over to TikTok. And we'll, we'll talk about um, that a little bit more. Next slide. Um, and again, so this, uh, this basically is another report um, from marketers insiderintelligence.com. And they showed, um, again, TikTok crossed 2 billion downloads across the App Store and Google Play in the first quarter of 2020, 2 billion. Um, and it saw a 325% growth. There were the, were the numbers in, tw in 2020 as well. And it's outgrown um, even Facebook, as I've already mentioned. So again, this is just to show that Twitter is, is a behemoth. Obviously, we know Google and YouTube are big as well. But in terms of growth, um, Instagram and TikTok both are still, are still growing uh, pretty, pretty rapidly. Um, okay, next slide. And so interesting thing for me. So one of the things that we talked about is, is just, you know, being able to meet our patients where, we, where, where they are and, and being able to sort of identify with our niche groups. For me, URIMs, um, I like to talk about regional anesthesia and um, I like to sort of make myself available as a mentor as, as Dr. Mariano has for me, for people who are interested, who seek me out and obviously are showing interest in medicine. Um, one of the other things that Dr. Mariano mentioned on Twitter, we also do, do very much so on, on TikTok and Instagram, which is collaborations with other healthcare professionals. Obviously, we're not trying to grow our accounts to be, uh, you know, in competition with the Kardashians or whatnot. But it, clearly, if the more followers you have, the more engagement you have, the more your information is, is spread, um, you know, around the platform. Um, and so it, it just, it's a good way for us to, to get, get whatever messages we have out there. So in 2019, I cold DM'd a lot of these people that you see here and more um, because I was like, you know what? I see where this is headed. I see what people are doing. There are a lot of people who are, you know, creating collaborations with other influencers on TikTok who are getting information out there. And it's really causing, obviously, a lot of engagement and, and for, for the content to go viral. Why can't us healthcare professionals do the same thing? So there's the Hype House, which was something that was really popular back in 2019 and 2020. I don't know if it's still popular now. There's many of these sort of quote unquote houses. We created something called the Hype Hospital, was sort of our little, uh, uh, you know, um, sort of spin on it. And what we did was uh, we wanted people to see us. We wanted people to see us. So our first collaboration that we, we posted was one that I put together. Um, this is me actually in the Stanford OR, no patients. I was off duty. I was not on the clock. There's no HIPAA information anywhere. I just set my phone up, made sure, looked around multiple times, double, triple check. Um, and created this little video that basically just shows us sort of um, doing this little routine that everyone was doing at the time that was going viral, but it was healthcare professionals, doctors, and many of us had white coats on, some of us had scrubs on, but basically we were just trying to show that us professionals, doctors can actually be cool too, um, and sort of using it as an opportunity for people to sort of uh, connect with us. And you can see, uh, go ahead and click um, at that. Since then, this has been, been viewed over 3 million times. Uh, it's been shared over 10,000 times, and there's 500,000 likes and over 2,000 comments. And so I don't, I don't mention that to brag or anything like that. I mean, obviously, it's cool. A lot of my friends here have over a million followers. They're all verified. It's just to show that, um, again, 2020 was a time, especially in the beginning of the pandemic, where people felt really bad for us. There was a lot of chaos, misinformation. The, the administration botched everything with regards to, you know, implementing policy and trying to inform people about what was going on. And frankly, a lot of things were happening so rapidly and we just didn't know. But that being said, um, you know, we were viewed very positively in the beginning because people realized that we're being put in a situation that sucks. And so was everyone else. But as healthcare professionals with, you know, PPE shortages and all the other things we were dealing with, clearly we were, we were in over our heads and really stressed out. And so people started following us and people started sharing our content. A lot of my friends 
had were you know being um um asked to go on good day america and ellen and being featured in multiple other media um outlets and it was a great thing for us because as as ed said we are very much so respected but over time the lure of becoming a physician has definitely lost some of it, of its um you know pizzazz i should say i mean it's it, it, at one point in the 70s you know my grandfather was a, was a surgeon the physician was someone that was very much so as 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 highly um uh sort of looked at as, as, as celebrities were. And now not so much, you know, as, as, as Dr. Karen Cyber mentioned at, at the CSA, and many of the, of, the, of, of the shows nowadays make fun of physicians, especially anesthesiologists actually, it's not a funny thing. It's actually a serious thing that we are, that we're not actually being portrayed in, in a serious professional way. Um, and so this is a good way for us to show people like, look, we do exist, we're professionals, but we can also um, have this light side but they didn't know that we were doing it to actually allow ourselves to combat misinformation. We've been in contact with uh, platforms like Instagram and TikTok. A lot of us are actually working with the creator program for TikTok, actually talking to them about how we can help them uh, you know, deal with misinformation, how we can verify uh, content creators so that we don't just have these random DIY doctors or people who are you know, sell selling potions or serums or whatever, tricking people into thinking that whatever they're doing is going to have some sort of medical benefit when we know it has no evidence to back it up what their claims whatsoever. So we do a lot of positive work for the platforms as well. And there's actually a lot of opportunities for us to potentially collaborate with them. So um, that was just sort of how we got started in 2020. And these, these are all their profiles now. Mine's not quite that large, but yeah, they're doing, they're doing really well. Next slide. And this is actually um, how I started. So um, I started off, you know, with these three posts. And as I just wanted to show you, like, you know, again, TikTok early on allows you for you to really go viral very fast. Next, um, next slide. This is the last post that I made um, at the end of Black History Month. It was uh, highlighting, uh, uh, you know, Black anesthesiologists, uh, highlighting the fact that there's only 3% of us um, that are represented in anesthesiology as African-Americans and 5% of physicians. And it was very well received when it went obviously very uh, viral on, on many platforms, not just TikTok, Instagram, LinkedIn, and, and um, uh, Twitter as well. Next. All right. Um, and so, of course, with great power comes great responsibility. So one of the issues that obviously a lot of people had with us, um, you know, being on TikTok and seeing a lot of doctors dancing and whatnot was, you know, okay. A lot of the old guard and that Twitter didn't like it very much. And many people were back and forth going, and as Dr. Mariana mentioned, how do I keep my doctors off of social media platforms because you know you get a lot of attention right and you can't take stuff back really easily once it's up there and some people may had missteps you know they posted things that shouldn't have been posted there were HIPAA violations or things that they thought were light-hearted but they actually turned out to be insulting to patients or or whatnot and and it just becomes a big problem people have lost their jobs and so this is an article that was posted in MIT Tech Review and and uh, Dr. Austin Chang who's a gastroenterologist who's also at um um, and, and in Pennsylvania, um, um, he works for Medtronic. He's also in Pennsylvania at Thomas Jefferson. He's their chief social media officer. He was quoted basically in this article talking about this very issue as the pandemic is, is uh, turning medics into social media influence, but, but even the most successful uh, being a, um, are, aren't ready to be uh, uh, po uh, social media influencers. It's, it's being positive influencers is, is difficult essentially. Um, and so he, he was discussing that in this article. So yes, lots of responsibility when obviously we're on this social media platform. But again, a lot of us have worked with the Biden administration, the Trump administration have done really positive things, but this is obviously the somewhat ugly side of it as well. Um, okay, next slide. So from all of the buzz that we got in 2020, uh, one of the things that obviously came about was Clubhouse as well. And so Clubhouse was a platform for us to communicate with patients again, and you know, many people, not just patients, but people who are interested in wanting, wanting information. Clubhouse was a platform that's sort of like radio mixed with Zoom, allows for you to basically have casual conversations. Many of the platforms have basically made um, sort of like additions to their, their platforms that are similar to, to, to the club, Clubhouse experience. Um, and so we actually had a club and it still exists, all things COVID. Um, that was that is it was one of the uh, most uh, highly attended uh, clubs in um, in in Clubhouse, and so every week it went from weekly to biweekly. Every week we would come together, myself and other board certified clinicians would come together, and we would actually give updates on what was going on during the pandemic. Of course, as Dr. Mariano mentioned, it can get really ugly and toxic. You have people who are trying to spew misinformation and saying all their voodoo medicine things, and of course, you know we respect people's opinions, we expect people's 
actually um, a disagreement, right? We Discourse is not the problem, but the problem obviously comes when you um, have issues really reaching people and then the misinformation that they're spreading can actually hurt people in terms of them not, you know, obviously getting vaccinated and whatnot. So we had to really be careful about how we sort of ran our rooms because there were a lot of rooms that were just going crazy with a lot of people saying wild things. This one, we were very strategic about who we brought up, very strategic about who we allowed to say anything um, because again, we didn't want to control the discussion and not allow people to ask questions that were concerns. We wanted to make sure that the time wasn't filled with people who were clearly just coming in to, to disrupt. Next. And from this, one of the cool things that I was able to, to do, uh, as Dr. Mar Mariano mentioned, and I'll try and wrap this up pretty quickly here, is I was able to actually, uh, and not just myself, uh, many of these clubhouse rooms were filled with people who were in, in media. So this reporter, uh, the staff writer for the LA Times reached out to me and she asked me if I wanted to participate in this, in this uh, editorial, this project that she sort of had. And basically it was, for me, it was perfect because I'm an African-American doctor. And I'm very much so concerned about you know, hesitancy and, 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 and equities uh, in terms of uh, vaccine distribution and uptake in my community. And so she wrote an article sort of discussing some of the things and quoted me and others as well, and basically discussed how I use social media to sort of reach people in my community to help get more uh, people um, sort of on board with the idea of getting vaccines, right? Like I don't work for a vaccine company. I'm not trying to get anyone vaccinated for monetary reasons. I'm just trying to keep people out of the hospital. And that was my main focus and all of our focus. And that's why I was really excited about um, uh, doing this. I'll say though, uh, next slide. Um, this is just a quote from, uh, from the article uh, that basically talked about what I just mentioned. When you uh, partake in opportunities like this, you do have to be very careful because you do wanna make sure that if you're going to work with media, that your words are not going to be twisted or manipulated to sort of push some sort of narrative or agenda. She didn't allow me to sort of read the entire final, final product, but she did allow me to have a good understanding of what the overall narrative of the post was going to be and how I was going to be used. And I felt comfortable with that, knowing um, that we had lots of discussions and that she didn't have, at least from what I can tell, and you don't always know, an agenda that I felt comfortable allowing her to use my name. Be very careful about who you let uh, sort of use your name and what you agree to. I can tell you, Dr. Mariano, and he can mention this, doesn't allow anyone to put his name on any papers that he's not able to proofread. And I think him telling me that was one of the reasons why I have this, 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 this sort of uh, policy myself is like, I'm not going to allow my name to go on anything that I can't take a look at before the final product is published. Because once it's published, that's it. And it could be the end of your, your social media career and, and your reputation. Next slide. This is another F, uh, project that I was able to, or a show, game show that I was able to to do. So Dr. Jamie Rutland and I are friends on social media. I've, I've known J Jamie for a couple of years, actually, when I was at Stanford. He's down in Orange County. He's a palm crit physician. Um, he also is, is uh, believe it or not, an immunologist as well. He's not an immunologist, but he actually did a lot of training in immunology as a palm crit physician. That's because obviously a lot of what he does is immunology in terms of asthma and IOD and whatnot. So for him, he really took off in this pandemic big time. And so he and I um, first met in real life for the first time when we auditioned for this show. The Producers for the show direct messaged me on Instagram and said, look, I know this is going to seem pretty crazy. I'm using my personal account, so it doesn't seem like a bot, but I really want you to audition for this show. You seem like you'd be a great person for this show. And I was like, I don't know, should I respond to this? What is this? This is so weird. And I started looking around. I was like, actually, this may look like this is so, you know, a real thing. And they wanted someone that I had known for years, that, that was someone that I grew up with even because we wanted good chemistry. And I explained to them, I wanted to have someone who was a physician because this was happening during the pandemic. And also one in African-American because there were a lot of things going on as they still are with regards to the racial tensions in this country post George Floyd. And so I told them about Jamie and I let them know we've known each other from, through social media, but we've never met in real life. And she's like, oh, I don't know. I'm not sure if this is going to really work out. We got there and audition. They loved us. They, they had us come out. We did, the, we did the, the, the taping and we were actually the, um, the premiere uh, uh, show. So it was a lot of fun. We didn't win. We came close. Um, and again, when you do things like this, you have to make sure that if you're gonna get involved with these things, because they are good for us in terms of getting physicians out there, um, you have to make sure that you talk to your department leadership and you also even talk to the hospital or group that you work for. I had to talk to legal because I need to make sure 
that if I'm up there, I need to know what I can and cannot say. They didn't want me to say anything about being at Cedars. They didn't want me to say anything about having any affiliation to the Cedars Anesthesia Department, but they were okay with me going and doing it. They actually moved my uh, call schedule around so that I can actually participate in this. So it actually ended up working out. That's why it's Dr. John from Los Angeles, not Dr. John from Cedars Sinai. But that's really important to mention um, because these things, again, can cause you problems if you're not careful. Next slide. Um, and last few things here. So have you Googled yourself? Uh, everyone should Google themselves, especially if you're on social media. You want to Google yourself and see kind of what's being said about you. Not to be, you know, sort of paranoid or anything, just to see. For me, I put in DocJP3 because that's the social media uh, handle that I pretty much use for all platforms except for Twitter. Twitter, someone else had it, so I had to use Dr. John Patton, which is fine because Twitter is, you know, Met Twitter is a little bit sort of more um, old school, you know, uh, medicine. And so Dr. John Patton worked well for that platform, but DocJP3 worked really well for some of the newer ones. And so you can see here, just putting in DocJP3, all of these things, you know, come up for me. Granted, I'm using my computer. So obviously the more you look for things on your computer, the more you're gonna see of things that are similar to that. But still, Twitter page pops up, Instagram, um, you can see other things there as well, um, Clubhouse. And so um, you wanna make sure that if you're going to be on social media, if you, whatever ones you choose to go on, that um, the feel and the touch is very similar across all the platforms. That's just a marketing 101. Um, if you can have the same handle for all platforms, that'd be great. The same look and feel, Austin Chang again, gastroenterologist over in, in Pennsylvania. Every single one of his platforms is a lot of blue. He does that intentionally, lots of blue. So that when people look and they see someone talking about gastroenterology and they see a lot of blue, likely they recognize him. So for me, DocJP3, I try to talk similarly on all, all platforms about things that I'm passionate about, anesthesia, uh, uh, underrepresented in medicine, issues that pertain to the black and brown community. So people know if they see me, that's what they're going to get. Um, and they also get to see my son and some of the things I like to do on the side as well. Um, all right, next slide. Um, okay, and so Dr. Mariano kind of mentioned this a little bit. Uh, you can click again, um, Ed. So there's this, there was a discussion back on, uh, sorry, back, back on my side. In 2021, uh, 2011, uh, there was a big discussion at the time about whether or not the online presence would surplus uh, replace the, the, the resume. And, you know, that's actually a legitimate discussion that people have. And Ed and I have been talking about this for a while. Even when I was at Stanford, he was telling me, and, and I don't know if you st you're still doing this, that in terms of like promotions for people in his group, he, he actually looks at what they're doing on social media. Like, how are they advancing the department and, and you know, the specialty on social media as, as, as a metric to, to determine, um, you know, uh, promotion status. And so it's really interesting when you think about it, this is 2015, again, the CV is dead on LinkedIn. Um, people are saying this because what you put online in terms of your work, all the stuff that Ed's talking about from publishing standpoint, people, things, things that people are creating on YouTube, all of that is a digital resume. It's basically telling people who you are and what you're all about and what, what work you do. And so it isn't to say that the CV is not important. It still is very, very much so important. It's just to say that um, if you don't have an online presence, you're gonna be behind. Um, and the faster you start one, the better. Again, I was not an early adopter to uh, Twitter. Dr. Mariano got me on when I was a Stanford resident. And I basically like Felipe and others, just follow his lead. Um, and it worked out really well for me on, on that platform. But in terms of, of TikTok and Instagram, um, we were on later, but we're still very early. You, know, you saw the numbers, like it's, this, these platforms are still growing very fast. And so the sooner you can get on, the sooner you can um, you know, create uh, content, if you want to, again, don't feel pressure to do it, um, the better. Next. And lastly, I just wanna mention, uh, we're, we're heading into the world of the metaverse. Um, and this is a very interesting place to be. You know, Pandora's box is open. We're more connected now than we've ever been, obviously. You know, the cell phones we have now are more, more powerful than any computer we had back in, in, in the 1900s and early 2020s or 20, 2000s and definitely even five to 10 years ago. You know, we have these devices that are super powerful and allow us to connect in ways that we've never been able to connect before. And we're very close to now being able to have this metaverse. No one really knows exactly what it's gonna be, but I will say this, we will have people on these platforms. They, they will be on the metaverse and they are going to seek out information. And if it's not coming from us, it's gonna be coming from people who don't have board certifications, who could be potentially saying things to increase their you know, bottom line that could potentially be harmful to our patients. And so us being on these platforms, us figuring out ways to utilize things like the metaverse and TikTok and Instagram and Twitter, is gonna be helpful one for career advancement, of course, you know, in terms of you being able to you know, bring some notoriety to yourself, you may be able to get some, some, some public you know, attention, potentially could put you in line, assuming you don't have any skeletons in your closet to be a Senator like Dr. Mariano uh, of some, at some point or a Congress uh, man or woman. Um, but you know, in terms of being able to communicate with our patients and meet the next generation, which is starting off on 
uh, you know, these devices when I didn't have them when I was, you know, in elementary school and middle school, we need to be on these platforms. It's coming. And so the faster we embrace them, the faster we learn how to utilize them, um, um, the better. And that's obviously uh, something that we're both very passionate about. And uh, this quote was basically uh, just what I said. Dr. Mariana added this slide. He updated his slide actually to show Michelle Obama here. So this is saying, uh, just First Lady Michelle Obama should say, uh, just try new things. Don't be afraid. Step out of your comfort zones and soar. All right. We all start from somewhere. You don't have to worry about, I don't have any followers. I don't have this. If you post things you're passionate about and people connect with you on an on a intimate level, um, you will grow. Um, you will grow. I didn't pay for anything. I didn't pay for any likes or follows. Um, I don't pay to uh, have my stuff pushed on social media. Basically, it grows, uh, however it grows, very organically. And, and that's the way it's been for me from the beginning. And I think the same for, for Dr. Mariano. That's it. Wonderful. Well, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Mariano, Dr. Patton, uh, for that um, wonderful kind of rundown. I wanted to open it up to um, our participants here for anyone who may have any questions.